Hello, bio students. Miss Sotomayor here. We are starting lesson three, biochemistry today, and we're going to be looking at enzymes. So let's get started. Now let's start with a warm up and a little bit of a review. Do you all remember the photosynthetic equation? I hope so. Do you remember where photosynthesis happens? It happens in the leaves, right, of plants. And inside these leaves, we have these mesophyll cells. And inside these plant cells, we have a chloroplast. And that's where photosynthesis happens. And we know that we need photosynthesis because it takes the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it converts it to oxygen. So it's something that we need. So a little bit of a review about the photosynthetic reaction. It is a chemical reaction. So what are the reactants? Now, remember that reactants are compounds that happen to be on the left side of the yield sign. So the yield sign is this arrow right here. So we see that water, light, and carbon dioxide are reactants. And products are compounds that are formed. So they happen to be on the right side of the yield sign. And we see here that glucose and oxygen are formed. We also see that the photosynthetic reaction has these coefficients here of six. And this is important so that the reaction is balanced. So chemical reactions need to be balanced because matter energy cannot be created nor destroyed, right? It can only be transferred and changed. So we need to make sure that reactions are balanced to obey the first law of thermodynamics. All right, so moving on here, we see that um, there are some key terms that we just saw just now. Reactants are substances that are changed during the reaction. They happen to be on the left side of the yield sign. And products are substances that are not so much created, but made, transformed during a reaction, and they happen to be on the right side of the yield sign. And we know that reactions need to be in, at an equilibrium, so that means that um, the, the amount of products that are made needs to be equal to the amount of reactants that are there, right? Because you can't produce a product out of nothing. So reactions need to be at an equilibrium. So there are some new key terms here. So what is bond energy? So if you remember from the previous lesson, we said that carbon has four valence electrons. That means that carbon can form covalent bonds with different atoms. And carbon loves to form a bond with hydrogen. And this is a covalent bond. So if we look inside this covalent bond right here, this bond that holds carbon and hydrogen together, this bond here has energy. So the amount of energy that will break this particular bond is called the bond energy. So if we have reactants on the left side, right, that need to be broken down into products, we first need to find the energy to break these bonds. So the activation energy is the amount of energy necessary to start a reaction. It's the amount of energy necessary that equals the total amount of bond energy or energy found within the bonds of the reactant. So notice that the activation energy is like a hill that reactions need to climb. Okay? So the, 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 the bigger and more complex the compound is, the steeper the hill, right? The steeper or the more activation energy is going to be required. So um, this kind of energy is potential energy. The activation energy required to turn reactants into products is potential energy. And reactions can sometimes occur like this, right? Where reactants are at a lower potential energy value than products. But it's not always like that. OK, so let's continue. So how do enzymes play a role in these chemical reactions? Well, enzymes are catalysts. So that pretty much means the same thing, right? So enzymes are an example of um, proteins. Enzymes are proteins. And enzymes are also catalysts. So they moderate the rate of metabolic reactions by acting as a catalysts. 
So what do catalysts do? So let's explore this graph here as we see what enzymes that are catalysts and what they do in a reaction. So here's the reaction progress, right? We know that um, compounds, which are called substrates, which are on the left side of the reaction. So let's write it here. So substrates get turned into products. Okay, so these substrates are the reactants, if you want to also call them that. So these, substrain, these substrates um, uh, are then going to be uh, broken down if it's a catabolic reaction, or they're going to be put together if it's an anabolic reaction. But these substrates are going to um, react in some way. So here's where we see the reaction progress. So what a catalyst or an enzyme ends up doing is that it decreases the activation energy. So remember how I told you that these substrates or these reactants are compounds that are held together right, by chemical bonds. So the atoms that make up these compounds are held together by chemical bonds. And in order to break these bonds that are found within the substrate, you need energy, right? So the free energy of activation is the energy that is normally required to break these bonds and allow the reaction to take place. So this is what we see here in blue. The normal, I guess we want to call it, right? The normal reaction in order to break the bonds of these substrates and allow the reaction to take place. But what happens when you add an enzyme to this reaction. So what happens when you add an enzyme to this um, catalytic reaction? So here we see that what enzymes do is that they decrease the activation energy. So notice how it used to take this much energy for the reaction to take place, and now it takes up this much energy. So a lot less energy is required for the reaction to take place. So it's kind of like taking a very steep hill, right, and kind of shrinking it to a much smaller hill. So now because you have this much smaller hill, right, now the activation energy with the enzyme or the delta G is going to be smaller. So that means that because you have less energy to overcome to turn these reactants into products, that means that the reaction is going to happen a lot faster. So this increases the reaction rate, and um, pretty much that's what enzymes do. They make reactions go faster by decreasing the energy of activation. Now, a couple things to keep in mind about enzymes is that they are not reactants or products, right? Enzymes are something else. Enzymes are a catalyst or a protein that's added to this type of particular reaction. And another thing about enzymes is that they're not changed during the reaction. So when these enzymes attach to these substrates and speed up this chemical reaction, once the reaction has come to an end, this enzyme can detach and this enzyme can go on to catalyze a new chemical reaction. Okay, so we have enzymes. Um, our cells have enzymes. Let's uh, recap what enzymes do. Enzymes are catalysts in living things. Remember that enzymes are proteins. They lower the activation energy. They, they increase the reaction rate, make reactions happen faster. They are not reactants or products. They are not changed by the reaction. And they control the rate of the reaction, right? the speed of the reaction. So why are enzymes necessary? Well, reactants are often found in low concentrations, and reactions often need to take place quickly. So when you have a particular substrate here, and notice this substrate, it's made up of two monomers held together, right? So if this substrate wants to quickly be converted into a product, so this substrate here is getting broken down, so here we see a catabolic reaction, um, what's going to happen? If we add an enzyme to the mix, so this guy right here in gray is the enzyme, so if we add an enzyme to the mix, 
the substrate is going to attach to the enzyme or vice versa. The enzyme is going to attach to the um, substrate. Now something to note about the enzyme. The enzyme has a particular site here called the active site which is the location on the enzyme where the substrate is going to attach. Now if you notice the shape of the active site it matches the shape of the substrate. So then that means that for every substrate, there is an enzyme that matches. So for example, if we think of the substrate lactose, lactose is a disaccharide. It's made up of two monomers. That substrate lactose has an enzyme called lactase, and this enzyme is going to speed up the breaking down of lactose into two individual monomers, which are glucose and galactose. So this is a catabolic reaction here. So once the substrate and the enzyme come together at the active site, they form an enzyme substrate complex, and then it forms an enzyme product complex. Then the products are released, and then the enzyme, remember, the enzyme is not changed by the reaction, so the enzyme can go on to catalyze another chemical reaction. All right, so again, you see here the enzymatic activity. Here we see the substrate binding to the enzyme at the active site. The enzyme breaks the bonds if it's a catabolic reaction. But remember that it can go the other way, right? You can have two monomers being put together into a polymer so it can form bonds, and this is an anabolic reaction. Um, it forms an enzyme substrate complex, and then the products are released. So um, in this particular example here, once again, you see a catabolic process, right? Because a substrate is being broken down, or a bigger piece is being broken down into smaller pieces, a polymer is being broken down into individual monomers, right? So it's a breakdown. Um, but in this particular reaction here, you see two individual monomers, and then what happens? These two individual monomers are put together into a product. So this is what we call an anabolic reaction. So the enzyme can break the bonds, but it can also form the bond. Now, um, one last thing to note is that when the enzyme and the substrate form this complex, remember that I told you that there is one particular enzyme for one particular substrate. So it's like a lock and key model, right? There is one particular key to open and unlock one particular lock. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. So not, so what that means is that an enzyme is going to be substrate specific. So one particular enzyme is not going to be able to catalyze chemical reactions of multiple substrates. It's only going to be able to catalyze a reaction of one particular substrate. Okay? So why this is why this lock and key complex model is important to realize. All right, moving on. There are three factors that affect an enzyme's function. So how do rates of reactions of an enzymatic activity happen? Well, it depends on the pH, it depends on the temperature, and it depends on the substrate concentration. So depending on what enzyme you are, you might be a stomach enzyme, and then that means that the pH at which you work um, is a low pH, right? Or, but you might be an enzyme that has an optimal pH of about 7, Right? So that means that you work in neither acidic or basic um, uh, conditions. So again, it depends on the enzyme, right? If you're an enzyme in the stomach, you're going to have a low pH. If you are an enzyme, for example, in, 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 um, in your eyes or in any type of other catalytic reaction, then you might have a higher pH. Same thing with temperature, right? Depending on the enzyme, if you're an enzyme found in a bacteria that um, inhabits really high um, temperatures, then 
you might be okay working at really high temperatures. But if you are an enzyme inside the human body, then you also have an optimal temperature. Okay? So um, the temperatures can vary, right? And the pH can vary depending on the type of enzyme. So what I'm trying to say here is that every enzyme will have an optimal pH and an optimal temperature in which they can function properly. So this is what these two graphs are telling you. Now, substrate concentration also affects the rate of the reaction. Um, if you notice here, as the substrate concentration increases, so does the rate of the reaction up to a certain point. And then what happens is that the, um, it doesn't matter if you keep adding more substrate, right, the rate of the reaction is going to plateau. And this is because there are only a certain number of enzyme active sites that are going to be available to catalyze that reaction. And after a certain amount of um, substrate has been added, if all those en enzyme active sites are taken, then that means that it doesn't matter how much more substrate you add, the chemical reaction is going to plateau. Okay, so here's a check for understanding. So enzymes work under specific conditions of pH and temperature. So look at the graph here. And what is the optimum or best temperature for amylase activity? So amylase is an enzyme that breaks down um, starch. So what do you think is the optimal temperature? And at what temperature does amylase stop functioning? So pause the video for a moment to answer these two questions. All right, you have an, oops, you have an answer. So the optimal temperature will be right here at 60 degrees Celsius. And at what temperature does the amylase stop functioning? Well, notice that um, at temperature 50, there's still some amylase activity, right? But somewhere around here, right? And then somewhere around here, the enzyme stops functioning. So I would say anywhere around 75 degrees Celsius, right, the enzyme stops functioning. And any time below, I don't know, 47 degrees Celsius, it stops functioning as well. Okay, moving on. So why do enzymes stop working? Well, that's because enzymes are proteins. And if you remember, uh, proteins have a particular conformational shape. Now, one thing to note about enzymes is that they are three-dimensional proteins. So we know that because of the shape of this protein, it's able to carry on a catalytic function. So enzymes will denature. That means that they will, they will lose their shape when exposed to suboptimal optimal temperature and pH values. So here we see an enzyme that is working great. Here we see an enzyme that's working great. And notice that that enzyme is a three-dimensional active protein, right? Well, if it loses its shape, then that means that it becomes an, an inactive protein or it does not work, right? Now, it can't attach to a substrate no longer because look at what's happened to the active site. Because it's lost its shape, the active site has also lost its shape. So now the substrate cannot attach, okay? Um, so here we see um, an example of an inactive protein. Um, here we see an example of no reconfiguration, which means that it's been permanently denatured. So for example, a fried egg, you can't get that protein back to its original shape. Um, here you see an example of reconfiguration of a protein that's temporarily den denatured, but it, it could potentially go back to its original shape, for example, warmed milk. Okay, well, that is it for today. I hope you've enjoyed lesson three.